Well, welcome all, and we'll start uh, this next, sec next session. Um, on, the theme is direct reprogramming, or also known as transdifferentiation. I'm Brock Reeve. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, and I'm happy to be moderating this session. I will be joined by Marius Wernig from Stanford and Sarah Ferber from the Shiva Medical Center. Um, but I'd like to, before uh, Marius and Sarah give their talks and then we uh, d discuss the theme and why we're interested in this area, I thought maybe I'd start with just a few comments to sort of set, set the stage. Um, since Shinya Yamanaka's work back in 2006 with induced pluripotent stem cells that put sort of the reprogramming discussion on the map, um, you, many of you will have seen in many presentations many versions of what was known as Waddington's landscape diagram, the hill where cells, balls rolled down the field or people drew analogies to skiers, you know, starting at the top of the mountain, going down different paths and ending up in a certain location to talk about the history of how cells differentiated and became what they were in adult life. And we thought that once you're at the bottom of the hill, there's no going back. Um, however, on, like skiers, they said, wait a minute, can't I take the lift back to the top of the mountain or even up the mountain? And going back to the top was what IPS cells were all about. And then people said, well, maybe I can just go from, you know, the restaurant at the bottom of one side to the restaurant on the bottom of the other side directly. Um, I'm probably stretching the analogy a little inappropriately here. Um, but the more we've come over the last few years, what, uh, the more we've come to see cells as programmable units with instructions that can sort of get applied at different times, we've realized that there really is no such thing as a fully differentiated state. And that has opened up all sorts of possibilities. And we'll hear about some of those, um, hear about some of those this afternoon. And one of the reasons that as we think about this, we should, um, we'll talk about you know, wh why is this interesting? Um, and there are a few things that it may, you know, be useful to have in the back of our minds. Um, you know, because this, is this sort of, because one of the questions that comes to mind is this, you know, is there real value in this or is this sort of a neat trick? Okay, we can tell a cell what to do, but, you know, why is that important? Um, as we think about it, we'll want to think about much as we've talked about with comparability with ES cells as we have with IPS cells. We'll talk about issues of residu residual pluripotency. You know, one of the issues with uh, uh, differentiation strategies has been so far in many cell states, we've only learned how to create fetal-like fetal cells, not mature cells. We know that reprogramming takes time and is highly inefficient. So one of the questions is, does this strategy solve any of those problems that we're otherwise faced with? Um, and hopefully our speakers will talk about that. Um, one of the, coming from, um, from Harvard today, um, this morning, I'm glad to see that both of our speakers have, a bo have Boston in their backgrounds and are examples of direct differentiation themselves. So Marius has been transplanted from the Whitehead to Stanford, and uh, Sarah did her, her postdoc work at Harvard and um, is, is now in Israel. So we do know that uh, direct differentiation works. You can go from one environment to another and thrive in an adult differentiated form. Um, I would point out that in the field, one of the early projects in diabetes, and Sarah will be talking about that later, was work at Harvard in an in vivo mouse uh, experiment that, that showed that you could turn pancreatic acinar cells into insulin producing be beta cells. And so one of the things we want to talk about is, you know, how does that stack up against other potential therapeutic strategies in diabetes? Another recent project, um, in Harvard, in, um, related to some of Marius's work, was creating induced motor neurons uh, for in, in vitro uh, te testing and creation of um, models of motor neuron disease. And so one of the things we want to talk about is where do techniques like this become useful in both in vitro and in vivo approaches. So with that in mind, I'd ask to start us in this discussion, I'll ask Marius Wernig from Stanford to come and share some thoughts and then um, Sarah will be next, and then we'll have questions, and we'll very much want your participation in that process. Marius.
All right. Um. Oh. Great. I found the point. <laughs> that that works. Okay, terrific. Well, thanks for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, actually, there's not, not much left for me to say in my introduction <laughs> of my talk. But I will still um, sort of uh, illustrate this a little bit with some, with some um, um, figure material. Um, so, um, yeah, as, um, as you just heard, um, um, much of this uh, sort of direct differentiation or trans differentiation really has started uh, with the discovery of the IPS error programming. And I think one, one of the critical um, 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 sort of secrets or uh, important um, components for the, for the breakthrough was that it actually requires a combination of transcription factors to, uh, to, to, to get the job done. Uh, well, you know, people have tried for a long time single factors, and, and uh, um, the people were successful um, with converting fibers into, into muscle cells, for example, with a single factor myOD. But you know uh, that didn't work really for other lineages for a long time. So with the IPS cell discovery, then um, um, the notion was that um, you start uh, with a totally wooden cell during development and, and restrict your development potential um, gradually, and you end up with uh, with uh, you know. Um, Fully mature adult cell, and by uh, and and the the um, sort of uh, molecular um, um, correlate is that you accumulate also epigenetic marks that uh, sort of shut down entire um, programs to determine other lineages that would not be used anymore uh, down down the, the line, and those sort of marks would be really um, sort of uh, irreversibly set. Um, and then, of course, the IPS cell, uh, IPS cell experiment, as well as the nuclear transfer experiment before, showed that this is actually um, possible to, re to remove all these epigenetic marks. And um, the, uh, but that also um, sort of um, 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 really led to a fairly simple um, explanation why you know you end up in, in a pluripotent state because you would simply erase all these differentiation associated epigenetic marks and therefore sort of by default you end up in a pluripotent state. So um, that is one um, um, hypothesis or one uh, idea to think about it but an, an alternative way to think about uh, IPS error programming is that actually it's not that you erase um, these very specific differentiation associated marks. What you actually do is with the transcription factors or when you put the cells to the oocyte in this environment that you um, install a very specific new set of epigenetic marks which are associated specifically with this, with this pluripotent um, state. And actually we know very well that um, there is no such thing as a tabula rasa in, in the pluripotent cells, DCS cells. Um, or uh, even the inner cell mass cells, you know, obviously they have all kind of um, DNA methylation and, and histomodification and, and so forth. So we, we thought this second um, 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 hypothesis is, is much, much more attractive. And if that is true, then the, uh, the sort of cyber skiing uh, should, be, should be quite possible, right? And that's exactly sort of the reason why we, why we got into this and, and, and thought uh, it, that could be possible. And sort of saying the same thing with this quadratic model that, that Rob also just alluded to is uh, simply um, um, comparing the cell in the, that differentiates during the embryo to, to, this, to this landscape here, and it would just fall gravity in, and, and has to make important decisions sort of which, which value to go down. And the IPS error program is simply sort of the same, the same route that the cell took, but backwards. So that's sort of still you know, uh, conceivable, but the question we asked is whether we can do something very new to the cell. So, so whether a cell, asking a question whether a cell can take a path that has not been seen before. Yeah, so as I mentioned, it was, um, uh, there were already some examples known before um, uh, that, that sort of really supported this, this latter hypothesis. And I mentioned myOD uh, uh, from fibroblast to muscle cells, but they were in, in particular in the endodermal lineage as well as in the, um, in the uh, hematopoietic lineages, a lot of examples for uh, transcription factors, single or combinations thereof, um, that could convert uh, cells into each other. But all these examples were limited to um, closely related cell types, such as within the endodermal, mesodermal, or ectodermal compartment. So we, we really wanted to know uh, whether we can make a big jump and uh, when we start with fibroblasts or endodermal cells, whether we could uh, convert these cells directly into, into ectodermal postmetallic neurons. 
And we, we were successful. Um, this is published a couple of years ago, so I, I um, uh, don't show you the, you know, the, the way we, we found these three factors. Um, just to, to, to mention their names, ASA1, Brain2, and MID1-like, which we uh, found were sufficient to convert fibroblasts into, into neurons. And they um, also had uh, not only molecular and biochemical properties of neurons, but also importantly, um, the two principal functional properties of neurons, uh, including uh, the ability to form action potentials, as well as the, the ability to, um, to receive synaptic input and project synaptic output onto other uh, onto other neurons. So um, one of the first questions we really asked is whether, uh, since we were working with, with fibroblasts, which, which, is, which is a very ill-defined cell population, obviously, you know, presumably um, mesodermal of origin, but not, not really well characterized, not re really well defined, can we really demonstrate that this cell lineage, direct cell lineage conversion um, is possible between two two major different um, cell compartments. And specifically, we asked whether we can convert um, hepatocytes, which are uh, of endodermal origin, obviously, into, into IN cells. And we took advantage of a very well characterized Cree, albumin Cree transgenic mouse, which is very well studied in the field. And is, there's no leaky uh, uh, expression of the Cree other than in the, in the um, hepatocyte uh, lineage. And we crossed this to a, um, to a um, Versus uh, reporter to, for, for lineage tracing. And uh, the system worked really well. So when you take primary cultures from, the, uh, from these animals, you see uh, that uh, in, in green, uh, the, the epithelial cells, the hepatocytes, and in red, due to the nature of the, of the lineage tracing um, um, uh, reporter mouse here, uh, are the non-hepatocyte cells. And um, uh, Samuele, the postdoc in the lab, who did these experiments when we, he um, it delivers the, uh, the three um, reprogramming factor that we had found for to work so well for fibroblasts, he could also clearly demonstrate both red as well as green uh, IN cells as shown here um, uh, in, in this immune uh, stainings here that these, these cells express neural markers. And we also went on, of course, to show that they are, they are also functional. So the, um, I think this... Uh, was a really important um, uh, data to, to make this you know, solid conclusion that it is actually possible to go directly from one um, uh, uh, germ layer lineage compartment into another without going uh, through the uh, iPS cell stage. So since then, um, there have been reported many, many more uh, examples. Uh, typically, people start from, from this uh, fibroblast population which is you know easily accessible and, and easy to work with and um, you know there, there's now really many many examples uh, into which directions we, we can push them um, both in um, uh, into endodermal as well as ectodermal lineages and of course we uh, there's a big focus on on the neural lineage and uh, in particular also the question whether we can get specific neuronal subtypes since there are so many of them in, in, in our brains and, and again, uh, motor neurons, as was just mentioned, um, is one of them, and that also also was successful. So um, uh, very intriguing. So just to um, also provide some food for the discussion later on, I, I just put in um, um, this comparison here. So you, you can ask, well, that's that's nice. You know, you can generate these these induced neuronal cells directly from fibroblasts. Well, we could do this before uh, with iPS cells. So what's really the principal, um, you know, difference, or you know, what's what's really the benefit? In, in, in terms of when, when, we, when we want to use these, these systems as tools for, um, for therapy or for, for um, modeling diseases and, and so on. Um, so I just put this, this little comparison there, which is you know, just, just a start. Obviously, um, the um, IN cell uh, formation is, is very fast, and, and uh, at least uh, in mouse, uh, also very, very efficient, and much more efficient, actually, than, than, uh, than the iPS cell formation. <laughs> So it's, it's much a much simpler uh, technical um, sort of approach than, than having to deal with um, you know, the IPS cell reprogramming. Um, the, um, uh, it's, it, the method uh, once once established is, is very robust and, and very reproducible. So it, it, um, the, of course this, the um, efficiency is varied to some degree, but you know the, it's re really it's an experiment that really always works um, and, and across many different. Um, um, uh, you know, mouse genetic backgrounds as well as human fibroblast populations. 
um, uh, surprisingly, what we found is that the, uh, the uh, neuronal population that we got was very homogeneous. Um, it turned out that the, the, at least all the functional uh, cells that, that we get in these, in these tissues from fibroblasts and from, um, from hepatocytes um, turned out to be excitatory in nature using those transcription factors that, that I just uh, mentioned to you. Whereas typically when you differentiate um, ES cells or IPS cells, you have you know, a mixture of both undifferentiated and more differentiated cells, as well as um, you know, a mixture of different kinds of neurons in, in addition. It's actually quite challenging to, to develop protocols that um, generates just one uh, neural subpopulation that you're interested in, and uh, that is, put, for example, very, uh, most relevant to your, the disease you're studying. Um, of course, compared to iPS cells, it's, it's not uh, so uh, uh, trivial to scale uh, this, this, this conversion because we are, we are working here with primary um, cell types, um, being it uh, fibroblasts, dermal fibroblasts, for example. They do proliferate uh, to some degree, but they are primary somatic cells, so they, they at some point they, they will senesce, unlike iPS cells, which uh, really can go on uh, forever in the incubators. And then, of course, once the cells are converted, they are post-mitotic, and then uh, you know the uh, uh, there there is no fuel left, if you want, right? So uh, there is no way to scale neurons once they are post-mitotic. Um, and again, compared to the IPS cell approach, um, this method is probably um, much easier not to scale on the on the cellular level, but it's easier to um, to you know generate um, uh, neuronal populations from many, many more patients than uh, using, using the I IPS cells. Of course, there's a big effort now in the field to automize um, and sort of industrialize the IPS cell uh, formation uh, and actually get IPS cell lines from you know, hundreds or thousands of patients. But it's still challenging, and, uh, and uh, there's still lots of issues in terms of quality control and line-to-line and -line variabilities between these IP IPS lines. Whereas here, it's, you know, it's fairly straightforward. You can you know, easily get you know, fibroblast populations from 10, 20 patients and then throw your, your factors on, onto, the, onto the cultures and then also generate um, uh, neuronal cells with just sort of one, uh, with one method. And I'm not saying that you know, not every individual uh, IN cell may, is really totally identical. Probably the same is true also for for this reprogram, just like with the IPS reprogram, that perhaps every cell that you get is slightly different, you know, or, or reprogrammed maybe to some different degree. So there will also be sort of similar um, heterogeneity in, in the system. But the advantage is that you have built this heterogeneity into your experiment. Yeah? So, so all the neurons, they, they represent this, this, this whole spectrum. Whereas with IPS cells, you, at some point you will have to pick clones, right? And then you, you, you have to you know you pick maybe three clones from 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 one dish and that's what you that's what you end up studying right so you you lose a lot of the representation of, of, of the whole population yeah sort of contrasting uh, uh, in this sort of similar um, um, alley here um, compared to IPS IPS program is is slower um, it seems to be much more inefficient and, and is more more laborious. As I mentioned, there is a, I think the, the main problem in the field really is the line-to-line -line vari variability and also just the, um, to identify the you know, uh, fully reprogrammed IPS cell clones where for, for further characterization. The differentiation turns out to be still uh, very challenging, even though there's you know, put, put a lot of effort into this now over the last years. Um, I mentioned the uh, you know, conventional differentiation um, usually uh, yield mixture of, of neuronal subtypes, but of course the great advantage is that it's scalable, um, and um, and you know we will see at, 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 uh, you know how far the technology will uh, will develop. That it's all will also be scalable from from uh, many um, individuals. So to sort of putting everything into into a nutshell, right? So this is the um, uh, sort of the the original idea uh, of the of the IPS cells, which is um, um, taking the you know biopsies from, from a patient, do the reprogramming, um, pick the colonies, establish a, a, a well-characterized IPS cell line, and then differentiate them into, into in, for example, into, into functional neurons for, for uh, studying a, a neural disease. And all these steps are associated with, with you know, a lot of time and money and, and, and a postdoc time, experiment time. 
And um, so it would, you know, it would be great uh, if, if, if the fibroblast to, to functional neuron um, uh, uh, conversion could sort of, at least uh, for, for some applications, replace this, this very laborious um, approach. Um, still, of course, we, uh, especially in the human, we, we, we need some time for, for the cells to mature into fully functional uh, cells. And, and uh, you know, we work hard to improve uh, the, uh, these, uh, the efficiencies and the, and, and the times to get m m mature neurons. Um, but at the same time, we then thought, well, so as I mentioned, so that this component here alone is already quite, quite challenging, right? And making the IPS lines, you know, that's <clears throat> there's a lot of um, um, accomplishment already, but the, the differentiation part still is, is a major, major problem. So we thought, why not try to combine actually these two approaches and use the uh, essentially the transcription factors uh, and sort of the, 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 the approach that we uh, that we generate to, to, to convert the fibroblasts into, into functional neurons and apply that to, to the IPS cells. And um, it, it really started with a, with a sort of a with a with a accident in, in the lab where we just were looking for some sort of positive control for our, our CNAs when we noticed when we introduced these three transcription factors that we call the BAM factors, AC1, brain two and, and mid one like into ES cells, that literally overnight, uh, within very few days, the uh, the, the cells uh, you know um, start to look like neurons. And uh, when we patch them as early as, as eight days, and I think another example is as early as six days, you have already very mature firing patterns of repetitive spontaneous action potentials. So we, we, we explored this um, a little more. And um, this was done in close collaboration with, with, with a team really of postdocs in, in Tom Sudov's lab and, and in our lab. Um, and so in, in the end, we came um, up with uh, uh, NGN2 or NeuroD1, which is very closely related basic helix loop helix factor alone would actually do this, this job already very efficiently. So um, here um, it's just uh, shown that the constructs that, that we use, we use a doxycycline inducible lentiviral system and um, uh, the sort of the, the, the optimi optimized protocol that, that was, was worked out by, by Ying Xia Cheng in, in Tom's, in, in Tom's uh, Sudov's lab. And uh, here is just some, some examples of, um, of, the, of the time course, in this case, an, an H1 ES cell line, um, you know, how quickly you actually see these, uh, these neuronal morphologies appearing um, you know, after in, in, uh, expression of this, this one single transcription factor. And then uh, at Tom's lab did the, did the terrific work of uh, uh, characterizing these cells um, very well. Um, we, we actually used uh, three independent lines, two IPS cell lines and one, one ES cell line in, in a very quantitative manner. And, and as you can see, all these lines worked um, uh, uh, very well. And actually, the, um, the, the values here in terms of you know, frequency uh, or amplitudes of, of um, postsynaptic currents and, and events in these cultures are very, very comparable uh, between these lines. So we think by sort of um, bypassing the uh, sort of slow, typically directed uh, or sort of inductive differentiation that people use conventionally, can, so, so, uh, which, which leads to this heterogeneity and, and very difficult to reproduce uh, uh, or difficult, difficult to reproduce protocols um, that with this transcription factor we, we may bypass these line-to-line -line variability at least to some degree um, and, um, and uh, have more comparable cultures, for example, between a disease and, and the control line. All right, so um, uh, I also wanted to um, sort of um, stop my, my presentation with, with one last story here, which is um, um, sort of addressing the question whether we can actually use this reprogramming system at all for uh, modeling um, a, a brain disease. Um, it's, of course, very difficult to uh, make the claim that any you know, ES cell or IPS cell derived neurons, human neurons, um, you know, have really anything to do with a neuron in our brains that have been generated in a completely different way in a three-dimensional context through a nine-month period of embryonic development and uh, many, many years of postnatal uh, maturation. Um, so in human, this experiment really is, is not possible. But in mouse, it is possible. And even though you, you might think, you know, mice are maybe not so exciting and we're really interested in humans, but 
we, we thought this is a really fundamental important question, whether these reprogrammed cells actually reflect the same things that are going on in, in the brain. So um, to introduce you uh, to, to, to the topic, I have to, to go a step back and um, tell you about uh, two families of, um, of genes, um, the neuric uh, uh, neurexins and the neuroligins. Um, neurexins are um, presynaptic uh, transmembrane uh, proteins of the, of, of the family of um, uh, adhesion molecules. They interact with the postsynaptic uh, neuroligins and they are, they, you know, they come in various flavors. There is uh, four neuroligins and uh, three neurexins, and neurexins come in alpha and beta form. So those those details don't, don't really matter. What is important is that they um, they interact and they um, are important for cell adhesion at the synapse. But more, not only that, they are also considered to be of functional relevance um, uh, and are thought to modulate. Um, synaptic transmission, not only um, for, you know, for, for structural uh, integrity. Um, so sure enough, there, there have been uh, mutations found in, in, in various, uh, or in genes of these, of these family members um, in both autism and schizophrenia. And of course, it's very intriguing to think that uh, you know, these neuropsychiatric diseases could actually be on the, on the cell biological level, um, a, a, you know, is, have synaptic um, um, cellular pathogenesis going on. So um, um, since Tom Sudhoff is working on, the, on these systems, he actually had already generated a mouse um, that carries a, a mutation that is found in a human uh, or a family uh, of autism in human and introduced that exact same mutation in, in, into the mouse and, and characterized this mouse brain uh, using acute uh, slices of, of, um, of or acute brain slices and then and then doing electrophysiological recording. So, you know, as close as you can get really to the in vivo situation. And what they um, found and is pub uh, published by, uh, by Ethel et al. Uh, is a very specific synaptic effect in, in these mice. Um, there is three major neurotransmitter receptors that, mediated, that mediate inhibitory and excitatory synaptic transmission in, in our brains. And it's also true for mouse brains, of course. It's um, the the AMPA and NMDA mediated component for excitatory synaptic transmission and GABA mediated um, uh, transmission for inhibitory uh, transmission. And what Etherton et al. found was that the GABA and NMDA synaptic transmission was perfectly intact. There was no, no changes whatsoever. However, the AMPA receptor mediated co component was about um, half uh, uh, of, the, of the amplitude as compared to the control. So, um, Soham Chanda and uh, Samuel Amaro in, in, in the lab, actually Soham is a shared poster with my lab and Tom Suda's lab, took the, the same mouse that Ethel and Al uh, took the brains from and didn't, didn't, didn't use anything um, uh, in, in the head, but took the tail of these mice and converted these tail fibroblasts into, uh, into N cells. And first, they asked whether these, uh, these uh, or this particular mutation affects and the reprogramming or the maturation stage or so of these of these cells. And they um, they measured the reprogramming efficiencies down here using using a fax assay, and they seemed very comparable. Also morphologically, they they looked very similar. They expressed all the appropriate markers, including synaptic markers, and also um, they had a very similar firing pattern and the fraction of cells that would fire was also very, very comparable. So it didn't seem that this mutation affects the reprogramming or the maturation state of these, of these cells. And then Soham went on to look at these uh, specific synaptic um, events that I just showed you, um, that, uh, which were reported from, from, from the mouse before. And he did um, these in two flavors. You can record these synaptic events either um, in spontaneous and, uh, or, or monitoring the spontaneous activity really without any experimental input, so just putting the electrode there and record what is there. Or you can also evoke the, um, the, the synaptic currents by, by stimulating the vicinity of the recorded cells. I just show you, or I show you first the spontaneous activity here. And um, so here's an example trace of the, of the, of the wild type and the, and the, and the mutant ion cells. And uh, here's, the, here's the quantification. I think you can, you can see already that there's less activity going on here in, in the mutant. And uh, this, is, this is quantified here in this accumulation plot. And both the frequency and the amplitude 
of the umpire receptor mediated uh, synaptic transmission was clearly reduced, whereas the um, iPSCs, um, which is the other component that, that you can measure in this, in this spontaneous mode, was completely unchanged. And um, to also have a look at the NMDA receptor component, which uh, the only way to, ad to address that is using the evoked uh, synaptic responses, he switched to, to sort of to that mode by, by stimulating um, you know, neighboring cells and then um, take the, sort of the, the synaptic response in response to, a, to action potentials from the projecting cells onto the recorded cell. And again, uh, he saw a, a very specific defect here in, in amplitude in the umpire receptor mediated component, whereas now the NMDA receptor component was, was unchanged and the IPS, the uh, IPS uh, or the inhibitory uh, GABA receptor mediated component was also completely unchanged. So that, um, in conclusion, is the exact same very specific uh, synaptic phenotype that we see in these, in these IN cells that, um, that we had seen in, in the mouse's brain before. And I think that is really, really exciting, even though it's just a mouse and um, you know, limited in principle to this one mutation. But we think this is a really you know, fundamental, uh, important finding because that, that I think gives us ammunition or um, you know, confidence that you know, things that we observe in these uh, so very artificial cells uh, that come from IPS cells or fibroblasts or so forth, uh, they actually um, uh, seem to reflect disease processes that, that, that are actually ongoing in, 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 in you know, eventually in the patient's brains. So with that, I would like to uh, close and thank the people, obviously, were, that are involved in, in all these studies. I mentioned, the, I think, the main uh, players already. We are very fortunate to have many collaborators, in particular uh, Tom Sudo, for, of course, who has been uh, a very close collaborator all, all along. And I think I um, would like to hand off to my next speaker. Thank you, Maris. Since we will have questions afterwards. Thank you. As you can see, that's, that's ver very exciting work. And even though conceptual, as Marius pointed out, much of this work um, started year years ago, the, uh, you all are the benef beneficiaries today of really um, exciting work that's really taken place only in the last few years and is even getting more exciting and is affecting multiple organs. And we'll hear about an another application, another area from Sarah. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, I would speak about transdifferentiation and its implementation in uh, autologous cell replacement therapy uh, in diabetes. Uh, diabetes is a prevalent disease affecting 7% of the world population, and 10% of these are type 1 diabetics in which uh, the pancreatic beta cells are being destroyed by autoimmune attack but also um, about 40% of type 2 diabetic patients uh, and all of type 1 diabetic patients are being treated by insulin injections, uh, which are no fun, um, in addition to hazards of hypoglycemia and all the diabetes-related uh, complications. Another option is, of course, pancreas, pancreas or islet cell transplantation, uh, which maintain um, a normal glycemia, continuous normal glycemia. However, um, it necessitates lifelong um, uh, immune suppression. And uh, of course, there is a shortage in tissue availability because usually uh, one needs uh, pancreata from, uh, or pancreatic islets from two to three cadaveric donors in order to treat one diabetic patient. So diabetic patient will greatly benefit from cell replacement therapy, uh, which will be available um, only when a new source of beta cells are found. And our hypothesis back in 98 uh, was that uh, master regulator transcription factors that control pancreas organogenesis in the embryo could also alter the developmental fate and function of adult cells. And uh, this what motivated us to analyze whether <clears throat> if we use a uh, master regulator uh, transcription factor such as P53, 
PDX1, a master regulator of pancreas organogenesis, and ectopically express it in liver, in vivo, in mice, would it activate the pancreatic lineage? And uh, which this was the case. We subcloned the um, PDX1 in a recombinant adenovirus, delivered it into uh, the uh, bloodstream, into the tail vein, um, which resulted in uh, PDX1 expression in the um, nuclei of the liver cells. And to our uh, surprise, um, at that time, remember it was a Nature Medicine paper in 2000, um, insulin uh, production started in um, uh, less than 1% of the liver cells. And that was functional because it ameliorated hyperglycemia in uh, diabetic mice rendered diabetic by uh, streptozototin. And since we use a non in, uh, a recombinant adenoviruses or adenoviruses do not integrate into the host genome. And uh, so uh, we were sure that um, uh, the effect of uh, insulin production uh, will disappear and, and we analyzed the process only for 12 days. But um, in a, since we knew that the, the recombinant adenovirus and the ectopic gene is going to disappear, we analyzed what happens uh, to uh, insulin production several months later. And uh, we saw that uh, insulin and glucagon, as well as endogenous PDX1, were there even half a year later. And they were functional eight months later because when we treated the mice with streptozototin, it, the hepatic insulin production protected against induction of diabetes. So we understood that the ectopic PDX1 is a short term trigger to a potentially let's say, non-reversible uh, developmental shift. Uh, uh, but now we know that uh, with uh, cell plasticity, you can never say uh, irreversible. And uh, just to uh, put the things in perspective, this is, a, again, modified from uh, a graph uh, uh, review. Uh, trans differentiation in vivo and in vitro uh, was there even before uh, induced pluripotency um, uh, started. Uh, it was not only us, but also Jonathan Slack showed that um, uh, you can convert liver to pancreas and pancreas to liver by ectopic expression of transcription factors, as well as Chan and Lee, uh, Lee Jun Yang. But there was a, a, a real boost by the seminal um, uh, findings by Yamanaka and friends uh, showing that when you use ectopic expression of stemness markers, you can push the developmental fate of adult tissues back towards uh, pluripotency. And as a, a, a my uh, colleague um, indicated, um, for just generating the alternate adult tissues, one can go directly um, uh, to, um, from fibroblasts to neurons uh, and not via uh, induced pluripotency. So um, just to see whether it can work in men, uh, we um, made a collaboration with the Liver Transplant Center, received over uh, 70 uh, liver specimens, human specimens, and analyzed the idea of whether the diabetic patient himself could be the donor of his own therapeutic tissue, uh, meaning that uh, the diabetic patient will um, um, donate a liver biopsy, which could be propagated, transdifferentiated, and then uh, being implanted back into the same patient instead of the pancreatic islets that are now being implanted uh, from uh, cadaveric donors. So uh, we move to an in vitro system of adult human liver cells and show that ectopic expression of uh, transcription factors, or PDX1, actually activate insulin production. Insulin is being stored in secretory vesicles and uh, it, uh, insulin is being processed. This is very important. It is being processed and, and secreted in a glucose-regulated manner, which is within the physiological range. Um, 
just to, uh, to maybe enlarge uh, whatever Mario said here before, that you can really cross uh, the barrier of distinct developmental uh, layers. But when we did exactly the same thing, uh, not in human liver cells, but in human fibroblasts, uh, excuse me, fibroblasts are fine, in keratinocytes, uh, the glucose dose response was ab abnormal. So you can actually very efficiently activate the, pancre the pancreatic lineage, but not all the function of a pancreatic beta cell, as you can do it in liver. Um, and when we implanted the cells in uh, diabetic uh, skid mice, uh, the human, uh, human transdifferentiated liver cells ameliorated diabetes. We could follow the human C peptide in these mice. Uh, these are the uh, implanted cells under the kidney capsule. And when you remove the kidney with the cells, uh, the mice revert to diabetes or to uh, hyperglycemia, and you see a, a, uh, you don't see anymore the human C peptide. Uh, we did not. The, the number of cells was not enough to uh, really um, bring the cells to um, normal glycemia, but you can see that glucose tolerance tests uh, very much resemble a uh, normal uh, glucose tolerance test. So what we've learned um, uh, in the last decade about transdifferentiation is, of course, that this is a direct uh, conversion of one adult uh, cell type to another. Uh, it is activated by lineage-specific transcription factors, but does not require insertion of uh, foreign genes uh, because the ectopic genes are only a short-term trigger. Uh, the, uh, the ectopic uh, short-term trigger uh, transcription factor activate a otherwise silent transcription factors that collaborate with it on activating the uh, desired repertoire. Um, it involves epigenetic modification of both chromatin and uh, DNA structure. Um, um, the activation of the alternate repertoire is associated by loss of the host uh, repertoire. For instance, insulin producing or transdifferentiated uh, liver cells that produce insulin no longer uh, produce also albumin. And uh, during, which is, which is very, very important, is that during transdifferentiation, the cells do not acquire at any stage stemless characteristics, which is a huge um, um, advantage or safety advantage. Um, the cells, uh, cells reprogrammed into committed lineages are usually post-mitotic. And I say usually because sometimes you get progenitors, and the progenitors do pro proliferate. Uh, but uh, this is indeed a, self, a, a safety advantage. And as Mario said before, the process is very fast and occurs within days. But in an effort to increase transdifferentiation efficiency, as we've heard, uh, people are using uh, more than one transcription factor. Because if we say that the, the ectopic transcription factor actually activates endogenous transcription factors, most of the researchers use more than one, uh, even um, three or more transcription factors. So it was very interesting to analyze whether, despite being fast, is transdifferentiation a one-stage process? or is it a, a sequential process? And um, uh, our, of course, hypothesis was if that would be a one-stage process, and we know that uh, PDX1 activates uh, all the uh, pancreatic hormone gene expression, then uh, we will see all the pancreatic hormones. And the, uh, uh, the point was that we could see uh, on the first day, we followed, we followed, uh, um, uh, hormone production or hormone gene expression on every sequential day with, for uh, five days. And we saw that uh, while somatostatin and uh, uh, glucagon were activated within the first day, you couldn't see insulin unless you were at four, the fourth day after um, ectopic PDX1 expression. And uh, together with that, 
we could see that some of the trans endogenous transcription factors were robustly activated on the first day, uh, NGN3, NeuroD, Pax4. Uh, however, the transcription factors that characterize beta cell, um, uh, MAF-A and NKX6.1 were only gradually and modestly activated. So in order uh, to ask uh, whether um, a transdifferentiation is a sequential or one-step process, uh, we did the next experiment again. We decided to uh, increase transdifferentiation efficiency by using three transcription factors. But um, um, what we choose the transcription factors that will uh, be known to activate distinct stages of pancreas organogenesis. PDX1, PAX4, and MAF-A, uh, which is uh, actually um, uh, more in, in, in a beta cell. And what we analyzed was uh, what will happen if we uh, provide these uh, three transcription factors together in the first day, or rather in a sequential mode, in a direct hierarchy as it occurs in a pancreas organogenesis in the embryo, or rather we will disturb the hierarchy and, and provide it in a sequential uh, uh, way, but in a uh, uh, disturbed hierarchy. And what we found out is yes, indeed three transcription factors are much better than one in activating, for instance, here insulin production. But this is an antibody that uh, both um, um, a, detects a insulin, proinsulin. Uh, it is not specific to uh, mature insulin. Uh, when we looked at the maturation along the beta cell lineage, what we found out is only at the situation where uh, the three transcription factors were supplied at a, a, in a sequential manner, one day apart from each other, but in a direct hierarchy, that was the only situation that allowed the maturation toward the beta cells, meaning that increased processing because this is C-peptide secretion and glucose-regulated uh, C-peptide uh, secretion. So what we've learned is that, um, yes, the transcription factors uh, are much, three transcription factors are much better than one. However, um, only the sequential uh, transcription factors um, uh, in a direct hierarchical manner promote the maturation of the beta cells, and this is uh, maybe more uh, elaborated in this uh, schematic presentation, which shows um, uh, that when we provide these three transcription factors in a, in a concerted way, we get progenitor cells. I, I, it's, it's a paper that is going to be uh, out uh, very shortly. And um, uh, in these progenitor cells, we see a concerted expression of insulin, glucagon, uh, somatostatin. While when we uh, introduce uh, the transcription factor in a sequential manner, uh, we can see maturation of insulin producing cell and a correct segregation from the other uh, pancreatic hormones. So now, um, of course, if we want to use uh, transdifferentiation in a clinical setting, uh, we have to remember that a, a, a beta cell mass in a, a 70 kilo individual uh, is about 1 billion cells, between 0.7 and 1 billion cells. So can we really generate 1 billion cells from a, a liver biopsy? And it seems that uh, um, it is that actually we can do that. So I lost this. Okay. And uh, it seems that we actually can do it. Uh, and this is because once the liver cells are adhere to the uh, uh, tissue culture uh, dish, they undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Uh, they carry APT, uh, mesenchymal markers, but they are specific uh, mesenchymal cells because they also express albumin and other um, um, hepatic markers. They proliferate very nicely, 
and uh, within a several uh, few months actually, two to three months, one can generate a billion cells that upon transdifferentiation undergo a mesenchymal to epithelial transition and stop proliferating. They become, as we've heard, post-mitotic and at this stage it could be implanted. At this stage we um, uh, established a company that is trying uh, to really uh, translate uh, the transdifferentiation of liver to pancreas into a therapy. And um, uh, what uh, Orgenesis is doing is, um, again, um, involved in um, uh, the uh, strategy of uh, cell proliferation because uh, uh, you have uh, to really increase the number of uh, cells to at least one to five billion cells in order to have uh, 0.7 uh, transdifferentiated uh, liver cells, and then um, to get rid of the transcription factors uh, in a recombinant adenovirus, ship the cells and try to implement it uh, or, or implant the cells instead of the uh, cells that are being um, that are uh, the pancreatic islets that are being uh, implanted uh, from the. Uh, exactly. I mean, we are adopting the same technique of islet cell transplantation into the portal vein, but now with the diabetic patient uh, own autologous uh, liver cells. So, um, just to summarize, uh, transdifferentiation, the direct uh, reprogramming of adult cells into alternate committed lineages, uh, we think holds a genuine promise uh, to the area of cell replacement therapy for diabetes as well as other de degenerative diseases. It is expected to alleviate the shortage of uh, tissue availability from cadaveric donors as well as the need for uh, using immunosuppressive uh, medication. The ongoing uh, development uh, challenges are uh, huge and uh, uh, they are, uh, we are concentrating now on large-scale expansion development of QCSAs, clinical development, and so on. Uh, I would like to thank you for, um, uh, for listening to me and uh, to thank uh, the uh, research group that they started with it, um, and uh, to thank our collaborators and the funding agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Marius, would you join us? Uh, so we have time for some questions, and I'm sure there are questions in the audience, and there should be a microphone in the back of the room, and we have one here. So please have a seat, and please, uh, to you guys, please have a seat, oh, and sure. to you guys, please ask questions. Questions? Someone? Well, well, yes. Yeah, we have one back there. Oh, my, microphone coming there. Oh, sorry. Um, this one is for Dr. Ferber. Um, so when you uh, inject these cells into the mice or in the future, a human, did you inject directly into the liver or uh, uh, into the pancreas? Or is that intra um, so, uh, IP or uh, IV? Here, sorry. Uh, uh, so um, the first experiments were that were performed in vivo were just by the uh, recombinant adenovirus. We didn't use cells. Now that we are using cells, um, when we are analyzing their function in vivo in skid mice, uh, we are implanting the cells in the kidney um, capsule. Okay. Um, however, we already uh, did some experiments in rats where we injected cells into the portal vein in the liver. Do you expect that uh, the cells will end up in the lung or in the? It's a, it's a normal biodistribution uh, study and uh, you, uh, this is what we are actually doing, trying to see what is the most um, optimal number of cells that will correct diabetes without uh, leaving the liver to the lung. Uh, so, but we didn't see.
One question that I would have actually for both of you um, is what, what, are, what do you see as the options for in vivo approaches in people? For example, Mary, you showed the picture of you know, the, the person in the hospital bed and you know, creating the iPS cells and how you can make that process shorter through, the, uh, through this uh, direct differentiation approach. And you're you know, taking liver cells out, processing them, and then giving them back. What about direct in vivo approaches where you don't have to do that? Yeah, actually, that's what I want to ask you, <laughs> because um, uh, no, I, I just asked you. I to, no. Yes, you know, so I can, no, it's okay. I, I can comment. I can comment. Like you know, yeah. uh, I think this is a very fascinating, uh, of course, idea, and there are. It is uh, what? A very, I think a very fascinating yeah. uh, idea, of course, um, um, but in the brain, it will not be so trivial, for sure. There, there is uh, probably a couple applications where I could see that uh, might be worth exploring. Um, uh, it might be difficult when you think of, um, you know, we had some panels this afternoon about FDA regulations or so right, to right. get to get this in the brain. But I was wondering, you know, for your applications, you, know, you have you have sort of the side by side experiments sort of done already, at, at least in a mouse. So what, what is your what is your take on on, on that? Wouldn't that be? Um, there is also you know claims that um, uh, you know cells, of course, are much happier in in vivo than in a culture dish. They're not meant to be on plastic. They're better. Uh, so, so you know, the, the, the maturation process might actually be much, much better when you just leave them in a, in a in vivo context. So um, I favor the in vivo approach, uh, but um, we thought we will meet some kind of uh, resistance from the regulators. Um, but um, to look at the science of it, when you deliver uh, pancreatic transcription factors into the liver, uh, it turns off the hepatic repertoire. So, uh, however, it does not activate the pancreatic repertoire in each one of the cells. It turns off the hepatic repertoire in each of the cells, but activate only in part of these cells, okay? You have to identify first which are, we think that there are transdifferentiation predisposed cells in the liver and you have to target these cells only because you don't want to harm other cells just for nothing. When you use a, a, a non-integratable um, trans, I mean, way of delivering uh, such as recombinant adenovirus, then um, you know, the, the ectopic gene disappears and it's fine. But um, when you are um, using other modalities. For instance, when, when we published the paper in Nature Medicine in the year 2000, people were trying to generate transgenic mice in which the PDX1 will be driven by a albumin promoter. And of course, the mice were born with no liver at all, uh, and they thought that this is because the acinar pancreas is being activated. But actually what happened, it was that PDX1 prevented the development of the liver. Uh, you don't want it uh, to happen when you treat the patients. So what you want is only to target the 0.5% of the liver cells that are capable of acquiring a new phenotype. But I think it's a cool idea to think of how to develop such a therapy. It, was, it will be a much cleaner and less costly. Um. But what? Yeah, question, sorry. Yeah, sorry, this question is probably from left field, but apparently it's been reported that making iPSCs from dermal cells obtained from older people is very difficult. I'm just wondering, if, has you, have you seen the same phenomenon in trans differentiation? In other words, if you try to make fibroblasts into liver cells or whatever, or neurons from older donors, is it really difficult to do that, or is it? Have you, have you looked so, at that? Um, actually, I'm not aware of that of this finding. Um, my understanding is it's, uh, it's actually the reprogramming efficiency of iPS cells don't really uh, are so much affected by the age of the, of the donor. And we, we actually see the same thing for, for making IN cells. So there is a big um, drop in efficiencies from embryonic to neonatal to adult stages. That's clear. And that is also true probably for iPS cells. But once you are adult, whether you are young adult, middle-aged, or very, very old, there is no d further drop in, in efficiencies. I don't know what yeah, do you, you find that too? In so? trans differentiation, we found that uh, the younger you are, the more efficient it is. 
Even in adult cells? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, question back there. Hi. Hi, this is for Professor Ferber. So, um, there are some restrictions for transplantation to young uh, type 1 diabetics. So, do you think that your technique will make the transplantation available for these young patients, type 1 di diabetics? So the question is, I, I, I'm not if, sure. If the um, trans-differentiated uh, cells will be um, then available for these kind of patients, the young patients of, let's say, 10, 10 or 12-year-old patients. If it will be suitable, uh, in what perspective? Uh, you are asking whether uh, trans-differentiation could suit uh, young patients of about 10 years um, for transplantation. For transplantation. Yes. Uh, see, young patients will not get islet cell transplantation because they have to be treated by immune suppression in yes. steroids and so on. Yes, that's that the That may problem. affect their growth. Yes. And uh, we actually, uh, when you're generating an autologous tissue, uh, you do not expect to uh, treat the patients with uh, uh, immune suppression drugs, so I don't see any reason why not to treat young patients by this approach. Oh, that's encouraging. Thank you. So, Sarah, maybe a, a variation on that question is what would you expect to be, I mean, the type 1 diabetes, you have an autoimmune attack, right? What would you expect to happen in your post differentiate, you know, your post uh, differentiation strategy. Would you yeah. expect those cells to be attacked as well? Yeah, uh, this is this is the question of when you trans differentiate the cells, how close are they to real beta cells? Um, so, um, from our experience in mice, uh, we analyzed this question. We took um, a over diabetic NOD mice which is a mouse model for type 1 diabetes. And we treated the mice by PDX1, which reverted their uh, diabetes. And um, um, so, and we found out that um, actually the cells are uh, resistant to autoimmune attack. Uh, in addition, we found that, for instance, these cells are resistant also to streptozotoxin. But data that you are generating in mice uh, does not mean necessarily uh, that it will be valid in men, and these things have to be directly analyzed um, uh, in men. Uh, there is not a nice way or direct way to analyze this question uh, if you're not doing uh, clinical trials, because there is not, not a convenient model to, to analyze it. Yes, back there. Dr. Ferber. Um, okay. Uh, my question is, when you uh, looked in vitro at your trans differentiation, you saw uh, an EMT, um, the uh, endothelial to mesenchymal transition. Do you think that has any role in trans differentiation and maybe your, the uh, small percent of cells that actually can take on a new phenotype? are ones that can become unattached in some way from their neighbors? And maybe go? I'm not sure, maybe. Um, because when we are doing the same approach in vivo, obviously there is no EMT. Uh, there is no epithelial to mesenchymal transition prior to the activation of the alternate repertoire. And uh, the efficiency of trans differentiation in vivo is much lower than that in vitro. Uh, so uh, we are not sure if uh, this is due uh, to the epithelial to mesenchymal transition or to uh, the increase in the number of the trans differentiation competent cells in vitro. These are two different things. Um, so I'm not sure if it answers your question. Yeah, quick question up here. Thank you. 
very much. Mary Sugair from Brazil, University of Sao Paulo. I was, first of all, uh, very impressed with your work, especially because it's autologous transplantation. But on the other hand, it strikes me that it would be much more uh, useful if you could encapsulate these cells and do allo transplantation. And I, I'm just mentioning this because there are some really good biopolymers for this purpose. We have just developed one that's been patent. So we can talk about this if you'd like. But I'd like to hear your comments, please. There are a lot of pro and cons in, in, in this uh, approach, of course. Um, uh, Some of the encapsulation, uh, the encapsulated cells could not uh, survive because of lack of uh, oxygen, but uh, I guess that uh, this is something you should uh, analyze first, yes. The idea was to, to really uh, do it in an um, autologous way, because uh, we thought it could be more clean or that uh, yeah, we could consider everything. Any, any last questions? I know we, well, one, one here, and then I know we'll, we'll, we'll let people go after that, because I know we've kept you past the 5 o'clock witching hour. Okay, I'll make my question brief. Yeah, please. So this has to do more with the human subject side of the, the research that you're doing. Um, in other talks, I've heard that there might be a concern in trying to convince uh, a patient you know, or the public to choose um, to involve themselves with stem cell research um, instead of doing traditional therapies. Do you think that either of you, that that's going to be something that's going to be easy to overcome, um, considering the fact that you kind of skip the IPSC step and the, the issues surrounding um, working with pluripotent stem cells as treatment? In other words, how do you convince the public not to use traditional therapies and to try these uh, new strategies to yeah. Um, alleviate their illness. Yeah, if I understand the question correctly, uh, so th I don't see, I don't think that that would be a problem. E even now, where we are very early stages, and we only work with usually with mice and rats, uh, you know, I regularly get requests from all kind of patients and patient groups. You know, when is, there is a clinical trial, can you let me know, and uh, or can you help me further? So I don't think that that will that be a problem. There's, there's a lot of demand. Yeah. Yeah, one. Good. Okay, th th thank you very much. Please join me in, in thanking the, the speakers again, and please continue the conversation.